and the present good evening to you and welcome to politics 101 on a wednesday evening and tonight we are going to be speaking with mr vincent alexander we're going to be talking about a range of issues um we are going to be talking about what's happening there at gcom we are going to be talking about the attack on it by the g by mr barra jack Dew and uh, um mr vincent alexander lawyer's letter and threat of um suing mr jack Dew uh, for defamation uh welcome to politics 101 I'm glad that you are joining us, whether you are coming from Guyana, you're joining us from in Guyana, or you're joining us from uh, further afield in the diaspora, North America, Europe, Africa, or whether you're joining us from our Caribbean, our wider Caribbean, lots of our people out there in the rest of the Caribbean, St. Martin, of course, um, uh, the Bahamas, Antigua, Lots, lots of uh, Guyanese resident in Antigua, St. Lucia. We do have people join us from St. Lucia, St. Kitts, Nevis. And um, somebody joined the other day from Anguilla. Anguilla used to be part of St. Kitts, Nevis, Anguilla Federation, and they seceded in the 1960s. Small island, very rich, lots of offshore banking there. Um, I have not come across anyone who uh, comes to us from Bermuda, but certainly some of our people are in the uh, Tocks and Caicos, the British Virgin Islands, the US Virgin Islands, St. Croix, St. John, St. Thomas. Um, I visited uh, St. Croix, very much like Guyana, a couple of years ago, well, uh, a few years ago, and met some Guyanese in St. Croix. I understand that um, lots more of Guyanese are there in St. Thomas. The U.S. Virgin Islands, which was once owned by Denmark, Denmark and the U.S., um, I think, bought those islands from, from, from the Danes. Um, so um, our people are all over the Caribbean, and Caribbean people are all over the rest of the Caribbean. We crisscross the region, and um, migration is part of our journey. Welcome to Politics 101. Politics 101 on a Wednesday evening. We are gearing up, of course, for um, Saturday, that big rally in uh, Golden Grove. I'm hoping to get somebody to come on tomorrow um, to speak about the big APNU AFC WPA rally in Golden Grove this weekend. That's on Saturday. And of course, these days, those things are carried live. So um, uh, you will be able to follow the rally if you are not in Guyana or if you are far away from Golden Grove, you would be able to follow what's going on. But if you can make it down to Golden Grove on Saturday, please go. The last rally, of course, was held a month ago um, in Georgetown at uh, the parade ground um, quite a big rally, APNU, AFC, WPA. Good to see the opposition parties on the same platform. And it was a welcome sign. People kept asking when the next rally would be held. Well, it's on Thursday. Sorry, on Saturday. On Saturday at Golden Grove. Welcome to Politics 101. Um, uh, if you're joining us from... St. Lucia, St. Lucia, welcome. Welcome to Politics 101. Lots going on. Of course, we had the Coffee 250 Forum on uh, the weekend and quite a stir. None of the traditional media has carried that forum. No, not one of them. Um, not the Kaichou News or the Stabrook News. Certainly not the Guyana Chronicle. Um, or the Guyana Times. Um, but what a world, what a country we live in, that there could be a forum, high profile forum as that, and uh, the media doesn't touch. And the media complain that social media is taking over, but social media carried it. It was carried on social media. Um, when we checked this morning, 
um, uh, more than 40,000 people had viewed the forum, uh, and yet the media in Guyana have not seen it fit to carry the Coffee 250 Forum on the emerging apartheid um, in Guyana. That is part of the apartheid. Can you imagine the Amerindians having a big forum or um, our Indian Guyanese brothers and sisters having a big forum or the Chinese and the media not carrying it or the Portuguese? I don't think so. I don't think so. But everybody takes African Guyanese for granted. Everybody um, uh, takes African Guyanese interests for granted. And so the media up till now have not carried one single word on that forum. Welcome to Politics 101. Welcome to Politics 101. Tonight, we're going to have Vincent Alexander coming on. Vincent Alexander is going to talk to us about the attack on Ipad G. Ipad G, the organization uh, that came into being to observe the international decade of the people of African descent. And by the way, Today is International Day of the People of African Descent. By the United Nations, nothing we are talking about in Guyana has not been sanctioned by the United Nations, which has designated, designated a decade. And today's International African Day, the are of course recognizing that despite constitutional changes around the world, despite the fall, the formal fall of the apartheid regime in South Africa, despite um, the formal fall of segregation, what is called American apartheid, I found one of the books that I use for one of my class, American apartheid. So when we talk about Guyanese apartheid, we are not out of place. I was looking for my copy of um, Jimmy Carter's book on uh, the Middle East, Pain Not Apartheid, um, in which he describes what happened, what, what, what's happening in, in the Middle East as apartheid. The practice of apartheid against the Palestinians, the, the Americans, it is American apartheid, right? So when we talk about Guyanese apartheid, of course, in America, the laws are not apartheid laws. America legally stopped segregation in 1964 with the passage of the Civil Rights Act. So the laws of the United States are not apartheid, but African Americans, according to scholars, continue to live under apartheid. Jimmy Carter, I was look, looking feverishly for my copy for the last two days. I know I saw it over the last six months because I needed to consult it for something I was writing, um, in which he describes what happens in the Middle East as apartheid. So when we in Guyana finally decided that we see all the makings of apartheid, the attorney general said the laws are not apartheid laws. And so we may be committing a crime by describing what's happening in Guyana's apartheid. Welcome to Politics 101. Vincent Alexander is with us tonight. We are going to be covering a range of issues. So please share the link. Please share the link um, so that we are going to be talking tonight about GCOM, lots of developments of GCOM. Uh, there is a timetable now for the uh, local government elections. It's slated for February. It first was November, then we are December. Now it's February. Um, so we're gonna be talking a little about that. Of course, the opposition coalition I uh, said that it will not participate in an election unless there is a clean voters list. GCOM uh, responded finally to say that it has to work with the laws 
And the law says that you have to extract the voters list from uh, the national list of registrants. And until that law is changed, they will have to work within the law. And uh, Mr. Norton said yesterday that he supports constitutional changes or uh, maybe statutory changes. Um, one does not necessarily have to change the constitution, but you can change the law, statutory law, as they call it, um, of the, I, I think, the representation of the People's Act to allow for a different method of compiling the voters list. I understand that Mr. Attorney General um, uh, tried to score some political points on Norton, but he did not commit the PPP, did not commit the PPP to support changing the law. We shall see. But we are going to be talking to Mr. Alexander about that. Um, uh, uh, you know, GCOM had um, opened the advertisement for, I think, a deputy CEO. Well, we don't know where that is. Mr. Alexander is going to bring us up to date. Everything that we can get about GCOM tonight, we're going to be talking about it. And of course, we are going to be talking about the attack on Ipada G. Ipada G. Ipada G is an organization that came into being to observe the international decade of the people of African descent. Mr. Granger took that initiative, I think, way back in 19, in 2016. He came to power in 2015, and he went to a Coffee 250 State of the Union forum, just, just like the one we had on the weekend. And um, he announced there that his government was committed towards observing the decade. And so Ipadaji came into being, and the new government came in. They didn't stop the monetary subvention, but they began to put pressure on Ipadaji. Ipadaji, uh, I think, reported that they asked for an increase twice, and they were turned on. All these uh, machinations on the part of uh, uh, the government. So we're going to talk to Mr. Alexander about that. And of course, the outlandish, defamatory declarations by the Vice President, Mr. Barajadio, you know, um, Teacher George used to say, you know, you know the by, you know by, you know by Bacchus, say yes, Teacher George. He said, be careful with him. He mouth around, he got a way bib. I, you all know what's a bib? <laughs> I think you put on baby. <laughs> well, little baby. And you got a way bib. We need a bib for Jack. He mouth run, run. And he, he, he talk and talk. And I read in the media that Vincent Alexander sent a liar's letter and threatened to sue him for big money. Jack Dio got away bib. He motor run like a little picnic. When you got bib and then you got get some. Peter Jack said, be careful with them. He motor run. Got away bib. Accusing Alexander and the other leaders of using the government money given to Ipadaji for their own purposes. Can you believe that? Ipadaji, of course, held a press conference refuting that. Welcome to Politics 101. Share the link, share the link, share the link so that we can get going with our discussion. Vincent is ready. So let's bring him in. Bring him in. Vincent Alexander, good evening, my brother. Good evening. Um, did, I, did I get Mr. Jack Dio wrong? When I said that he was slandering the leaders of Ipadaji, you, of course, are the chairman of Ipadaji. And um, did I get it wrong when I said he was slandering you all for and saying that you're using the money given to Ipadaji for your all personal purposes? No, certainly not. Jack Dio used the occasion of the Coffee to Fifth Congress 
to launch an attack on leaders of the Pali G. In that news conference, he said that he singled out two leaders and in fact started off by saying that if Padaji was benefiting from the large of the government and that apparently they were paying us to attack the government. What in effect Jagdeo was saying is if the government gives us money, we must give up our freedom of expression. That's what he was saying. Mm -hmm. Give you money, shut your mouth, and do what we say you should be doing. So he sought to attack us. Uh, let me backtrack. On the morning of his press conference, the Ministry of Culture, Youth, and Sport around the eight o'clock hour, called the Padiji and asked for our financial report and, and, and for our legal registration. We have no problems with those documents. And in fact, we were able to deliver them forthwith. He then sought to use those documents against us. He sought to say that we were a limited liability company. And as a limited liability company, we were the beneficiaries of whatever that company has. And that's the first um, set of misinformation. We are indeed registered under the Companies Act. But if you see our registration documents, which he saw, clearly states that we are not for profit, as well as it clearly states that we are not issuing shares. So there are no shareholders, there is no profit, and there is no way how true shareholding and profits we can benefit. But he went on in his diatribe to indicate that we were doing things for ourselves on the backs of the people of African descent. Asking the people of African descent to what extent they have benefited from the monies. Now, there's this smart thing going around, everybody mentioned 500 million. We got in 2018, 68, and subsequent years, 100 million. So it's really, that figure 500 million is to give you the impression we have that, that large a sum of money which in itself is not a large sum. But we get 100 million a year to do the work of the Padiji, and he's attempted to suggest to the public that the people from the African communities have not benefited, and that somehow or the other, Alexander and others have creamed this money off for themselves. Now for me, that is slanderous and libelous, and therefore on that regard, I'm going to meet him uh, in court. So as I was saying, the Padiji is in fact registered under the Companies Act. And you know, an interesting thing uh, happened today. I was at an anti-corruption forum and there were other non-governmental organizations. And believe you me, like the Padiji, they are also registered under the Companies Act as not not-for-profit and not being uh, share shareholding companies. So it's not a prodigy that's, that's like that, and it's, it's really an attempt to mislead people, to give the impression that there's some private company and we are taking the government's money into our, into our um, custody for personal use. That's far from what has occurred. And so the next point I want to make is that Jack, you had access to our financial statement 2020. That statement showed the complete expenditure for the 100, uh, the 100 million. He did not make known to the public the complete expenditure. What he did, he picked out how much he paid in salaries and attempted to do two things about that. To say one, that you paid a lot of salaries and also attempted to say 
to insinuate that these salaries were going to us, the so-called shareholders. And that's the first thing we have to develop. The PADG has volunteers in its coordinating council, and none of those volunteers are paid a salary by PADG, none. So we are not recipients of any salaries. All the salaries we pay are salaries paid to a professional staff to provide the services which is PADG is trying to provide to the African Guyanese community. So that's the first point you want to make. The second thing he did, he again looked at 100 million for 2020 and looked at the figure in our accounts of 343,000 as a disbursement for grants in the 2020 statement. And then said that we had 100 million and only gave all grants to the tune of 343,000. The fact of the matter is that we did give out 343,000 in 2020, but that amount was not given out from the 100,000, the 100,000, the 100 million, which is not given to us for the purpose of grants per se. It was given out from a 10 million sum, which was given to us in 2018, separate and apart from our shareholders, specifically for grants. Those grants were disbursed in the main in 2019, with a residual sum of 343,000 being disbursed in 2020. That has nothing to do with a 100, 100 million grant. Therefore, he gross, grossly, uh, crassly misrepresented, given the public the impression that we had $100 million of grants and only given out grants to $343,000. Uh, and did not disclose to the public the entirety of our expenditures, the document which he had in his possession. But then posed questions as if he didn't have the answers as to how much you pay for rent, how much you pay for travel, and a whole range of things. All of that information is available to Jack Leo. He had a document and it's available to the public. There's absolutely no situation where we are the recipients of salaries. There's absolutely no situation where we only gave out 343,000 grants against 100 million. But there is a situation where we have done a number of things in terms of empowerment of the people of Africa, including in some instances, financial assistance to groups to help them in their entrepreneurial and economic activities. President Alexander setting the record straight uh, in relation to uh, uh, a part of G and uh, its expenditures, what it has been doing, uh, coming under attack from Mr. Jack Dew, um, who has the, this propensity for talking and talking off the top of his head. You know, and I, I those of you who are now joining us, I, 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 as I reflect on his behavior, I, I remember Teacher George Young. Teacher George was the Proverbs man. In Guyana, and, you know, he talk in proverbs, and you know, he you pass. He said, "I said, by me, you go where?" I say yes, teacher. I say, where you go? I say Washington. You know, you know, by Thomas. I say yes, teacher. George. He said, "There, Washington, be careful with him. He mount a run. He a wear bimp. We got get bimp full full Jack Bio. He runs his mouth. He has all the records. He's not a dummy." He's an economist, trained economist. He can go over numbers, and yet he did what he did, which means he had other motives. And Vincent, for the purposes of some of our viewers who may not know what a prodigy was set up for and what it has been doing in the last, um, what, six years or so, um, if you can spend a little time talking, giving us a little overview um, of what the organization is about, what's its composition, and what you've been doing. Actually, it's not six years. The Palaji became uh, operational in 2018. 
We spent in the all of 2017, after the 2016 exhortations of the uh, then president, establishing a strategy through a consensual collective process. The African Guyanese organizations came together and Gangud put their heads together for over one year to determine how we would establish a strategy and how we would go forward. So we are from 2018 to 2022. So that's, that's approximately four years we've been in operation. The other point I want to make before I get to your, your question per se, and this is related to your question in some regards. One of the things that Jack Dio told the public is that we had spent over 4 million on a survey of people uh, who had not gained flood relief. That is true, unapologetically. But he went on to say that to have done that was to misuse the money because that is political work. That's the work of the PNC. <clears throat> now, Epadigy is an organization established under the United Nations Declaration of 2013, to which declaration the government of Ghana then subscribed, bringing the decade into existence in 2015, in pursuit of recognition, justice, and development for people of African descent. We didn't make that up. The UN made that up. If you want to say it's made up. If there is a flood, and it comes to our knowledge that whether intentionally or otherwise, lots of people are not being attended to by the state in this flood relief program. What is wrong and what is political about us in the pursuit of fairness, justice? That's what we established for. Doing a survey to identify the people who had not been attended to. But more than that, we didn't simply do a survey. I personally visited the Minister of Agriculture and brought his attention what was occurring. On behalf of the party, I intimated to him our intention. He concurred. He said that the government had no intention of discriminating against anyone. And if there were people who had been omitted, then he had absolutely no problem with us bringing forward those names. We established an exercise across the coast and the region 10, where we paid the numerators to go from farm to farm and house to house to find out if people had been omitted. And incidentally, in that process, indo Guyanese were also included in our submissions. We presented to the Ministry of Agriculture approximately 4,000 names wow. of those who had been, uh, who had not been registered. And in fact, after we started our exercise, the Ministry of Agriculture itself, we opened their exercise to say that they had not completed the registration. We submitted those names. They asked for further information, we gave further information. The Minister of Agriculture went to the Parliament and waved my letter to show the nation that he was collaborating with Epadigy on this matter. Yet Jagdio goes to the public to say we were doing the PNC work. We never made public uh, propaganda of the exercise. That was not our business. Our business was ensuring that people who had been admitted were included. And so we spent money under the team of recognizing justice and development, seeking fairness and justice for those people who had been omitted. So it part of you was established under the United Nations Declaration, and it brought together a number of African Guyanese organizations. At the time of its establishment, if I'm not mistaken, 17 organizations had been meeting for over a year. Once we established our charter, we opened up ourselves to every afro guyanese organization. We now have approximately 68 afro guyanese organizations that are members of the 
And that is why we are called in the National Day to the people of African descent, assembly, because the assembly symbolizes the assembly of 68 organizations. And we do meet as a general assembly with those 68 organizations spreading from Guyana right through the charity of Interlinden being represented. When those organizations get together in the general assembly, they identify membership for a number of committees. Committees that we have look at education, employment, economics, expiation, equity, all of which were thematics found in the Declaration of the United Nations. We thought that youth was important, and so to those thematics, we added youth. And so we have six committees. So the assembly identifies membership for those six committees. Those six committees then convene and they identify a chairperson from among themselves. It is the chairpersons of those six committees who comprise the coordinating council of the party G. So for all intents and purposes, the coordinating council is a bottom-up arrangement starting with the assembly, identifying the committee. The chairperson is directly elected by the assembly and the CEO appointment is ratified by the assembly. So everything has its origin for all intents and purposes in the assembly. And so we set out to do work under those, those headings, education, expiation, equity, employment, uh, economics and the youth. So we have a work program every year under those headings. What we sought to do at the very inception was to establish a strategic plan. And so what we did was to hold consultations across the African Guyanese community to determine what should be in our strategic plan. Again, that is what we want. And having done that, that is what we use to guide the work, the work that we do. Our strategic plan focuses on three areas of operation, projects, programs, and policies. Policies means that like what the United Nations pointed to in its declaration, there's the need for national policy to be implemented, to be amended, to be adjusted, to facilitate recognition, justice, and development for the people of Africa. So one of our platforms is policy. We advocate for policy, not to the detriment of anyone, but as a form of redress for the historical wrong which has been meted out to the people of African descent. Give an example or examples in the area of policy. We have in the last government, and during this government, attempted to speak with the Ministry of Education, the teaching of history, proper Guyanese history in our schools, because we associate history with people knowing themselves, and history with the wider society to recognize you for who you are. That's one of the areas of our country. We also are involved in advocacy in relation to the use of marijuana as as something that the Rastafarian movement uses, not for the fun of using it, but for ritualistic purposes. So we have had conversation with government in that regard. And that's, that's the kind of policy orientation. There are other areas of policy. Uh, local government, for example, we have petitioned government on the question of reintroduction of village councils as is provided for in our constitution, so that in those villages, the people in the villages can have control over their local fears, a form of decentralization. We have also operate on the programs. And in the context of programs, it means how do we speak in the government, implementing programs that are beneficial. They can be programs in health. One would know different ethnic groups may have different dietary problems, may have different problems in terms of what 
the diseases that affect the diet. And therefore, government may wish to put in place a program that addresses things like those. Similarly, in education, they may wish to put in place programs because if people have lost knowledge of the history, then they've lost their way. And so programs need to be put in place to help them to do that, as well as programs that can help in mutual respect and cohesion across the ethnic group. And then projects. And the government can pursue specific projects that are there to uh, help the people of African descent. We ourselves are also interested in with the little that we have doing projects. So for example, we have been involved in a project, educational project, where we bring in contractors and we try to educate them in the manner that makes them ready to apply for contract. We have been involved in funding the night schools which were closed as a part of our projects. We have been we were involved in the very inception of getting 50 persons trained as auto electricians at GITC. So there are projects which we are directly involved in as well. We are presently pursuing a project that seeks to do some training of seafarers so that people can get involved in the, the oil industry and blow around with the movement themselves. So those we are also involved in projects. We have funded uh, uh, investor funds for young people to encourage them to be involved in the entrepreneurship. We have funded uh, business exposed to young people, again, to encourage them and their involvement in business. We have funded uh, two fairs so far, one last year in the Square of the Revolution, one this year where we attracted over 200 small business people. And we don't just bring them together. Before we bring them together, we do training with them to help them in areas of marketing and packaging and things like that, management of their, their businesses. We have gone into communities like Mocha Arcadia and we have funded their, their market day. We've not just funded the market day, we've done training. So for example, those who are involved in pig rearing can get involved in the production of palm, value added. And so you will be proudly say, for example, that Mocha now produces uh, chicken ham because of the training they were exposed to. So the things we've been doing across the country of course, we have not been able to meet all of the expectations of people of African descent. The state of the people of African descent, we certainly can't meet their expectations to $100 million a year. We can't. We can't. But we've been trying to meet their expectations. And our approach has been more in dealing with the people of African descent to empower them, to give them the tools to do things rather than to do things for them. Because doing things for them does not speak to sustainability. So our idea is to tool them, empower them, so they can sustain what they're getting involved in. And here it is, we're doing these things, and people are being told that we've gotten 100 million and how have they benefited. And what is being driven into their minds is that they personally should be collecting money, and not seeing the, the macro level which we are operating, and the way in which the people we touch with empowerment are to take forward the, the skills and the knowledge and the competencies, then that will in fact impact the, the wider community and enhance the, the, the state of African Guinea at large. It is shameful that with the work which we are doing and the manner in which we have we recognize that the African Guyanese community is not homogeneous from many perspectives, including the political perspective. And we are not about excluding someone because they may be APNU or PPP or whatever the case may be. And therefore, we be careful not to get involved in the politics because we don't want to interfere with the rights of individuals have their own political view. But at the same time, we have commonalities with people of African descent and the idea that we can work with those commonalities. I think that you will tell people of African descent what they get from 100 million, as if that is what is going to solve their problems, is an insult to 
people of African descent. And we ought to wake up and not smell the roses and understand that that so-called intimation that you're not getting something is quite an insult. Because if we were attempt to give a hundred million, the people of African descent, find out what they would get. They would get a drop in the sea in comparison to giving 250,000 to workers who are already gotten their uh, separation money from guys. It would be a drop in the sea. It would have absolutely no real meaning in their lives. We are of the view that to do employment work can be far more impacting in the community, and that is exactly what we do. You know, this going after we had, I would say, some internal problems, and that's far from course. And last year, we were called in by the minister, who said he wanted to meet us. And we went. He did not meet us, the permanent secretary. And she posed three questions. She posed the question, are you buying a property? You know you can't buy a property with government money. And we said, we're not buying a property with government money, but we want to buy it. She says, are you registered under the Friends Society Act? We said, no. We are registered as a non-profit non -profit company. We don't have shares, and we're comfortable with that. And she says, have you held your annual meeting? We said, we've not yet held it. It was postponed for good reason. We're working towards it. It has since been held. Those are the three questions we asked. At that meeting, I said to her, we are desirous of meeting the minister. You convey to him that message. No response. No response. Close to a year, minister has given us no response. But today, we got correspondence from the same minister saying that because what's in the public domain, and in the main, what's in the public domain is what Jack Dew has said, that in the interest of accountability, they want all of our financial documents from vouchers right up so that they can determine that we have been spending our money in the intended purpose, that we've been spending our money beneficially to the people of African descent. I, I don't know who determines what's beneficial to the people of African descent. The people themselves determine that, or if somebody else. But that is what they want these documents for. We have no problem with those documents because we know that you're above board. But that minister didn't have the courtesy of speaking with an organization that represents 68 organizations across the landscape. But no sense is for all of our documents. Bearing in mind that in addition to him calling us in last year, the Ministry of Finance said that because of some letter in the paper that they had sent the special team to investigate the financial affairs of the pathogen. So we were subject to investigation last year into this year, which has produced a report which is available to the government. But three to four months after that investigation is concluded, and that report is submitted, the minister now writes us because he says in the papers again, people are talking about it. To submit the same document that were interrogated for them to determine if we are doing the right thing with the money. That can be no less than an attempt, and no less than an attempt to stymie the work of the prodigy and to drive wedges in the prodigy between the tradition and the African community and among the community. And those wedges have been uh, utilized sometime now because last year, and in fact this year during Black African Week month, Jan Dio went about to African Guyanese organizations. And one of the things he was asking them, if they have benefited from 100 million, and he, he very dangerously said, given to Alexander, if they have benefited from 100 million, given to Alexander. Alexander is not the recipient of 100 million. 
the prodigy, as we say. Alexander as chairperson is not the recipient of a dice, of a dice. And everything in the future will vindicate what I'm saying. The investigation has already vindicated me. Our audited reports for 2018, 2019, 2020 have been vindicated me. Everything else will vindicate me because I'm not culturally a kleptomaniac. I'm not culturally a thief. I've been a public officer for years. And my performance as a public officer in relation to my fiduciary responsibilities and my fiscal responsibilities speaks for itself. It's history. And no Jack Dio, no Jack Dio can point a finger at me on such matters. I can only see the attempt being made is to interfere with the leadership of the organization, which organization they want to decapitate and destroy for reasons best known to themselves. Because all the organization is doing is pursuing a mandate of a declaration which they signed into in 2013. An organization which has said to President Afranali, let's sit and speak. President Afranali has said to me personally on two occasions, that he will sit and speak with us. The public has made much fun of my handshake with President Ali and the act of whispering in his ears when I reminded him that he had previously agreed to meet, that we had previously written, in fact, he had agreed twice, once to meet, and he, on that occasion, once again agreed. But here it is. The meeting has not been held. Everything is being done to put us in the light that will let President Ali say, why am I meeting with them? So what is afoot seems to be, among other things, an attempt to ensure that there is no meeting between the president and the prodigy. The prodigy represents 68 African Chinese organizations. And the work of the Pathogy is not about 68 African Chinese organizations. When we deal with contractors, we advertise publicly. And any African Chinese, you don't have to be affiliated, can come to those sessions for empowerment. When we fund the night school, those night schools have nothing to do with arms of the strategy. Those night schools have to do with people of African descent who are seeking a second chance by going to night school. And we function. And all that we do is aim, not at 68 organizations, it's aim at the wider African Guyanese community. Not the exclusion of doing things for our organizations as well. We are presently in the process. Of this person, not lots, so it's 100,000. There's many organizations as have applied for them to be engaged in some activity to mark emancipation, hopefully an activity that can be sustained. Vincent Alexander here telling us a lot, more than a mouthful here tonight. We in the wider public had no, 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 knowledge of the kind of harassment that uh, 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 an assembly of 68 African Guyanese organizations has to go through for $100 million. It is nothing short of harassment, intimidation, and it's an insult to the integrity of our country. Whatever else has happened in our country, whatever else, we've had our ethnic differences and our ethnic conflict. But no government has ever gone that low, that low. On my audience, I hope you all are listening intently. That when we say that we live in an emerging apartheid state, that there is so much going on in terms of harassment 
of African Guyanese individuals, African Guyanese organizations that we do not know about. And now that we have rung the bell, we want you all to come and pour it out to us as Brother Vincent is doing it tonight. Because so many African Guyanese organizations and individuals and institutions apparently have been suffering in silence. The harassment of these people, let us bring it out. You know, I am very sure that there are other ethnic organizations or organizations representing all the ethnic groups get government subvention. We would want to know whether they go through the kind of harassment, whether they are asked to produce vouchers. The government has announced that it has given a whole set of money for cricket. We want to ask and we want evidence that money is going where it's intended to go. Why harass African Guyanese? But as it as Coffee 250 has said, we have to resist the emerging apartheid state. Vincent, time is going, and let's uh, switch a little bit to GCOM. What's happening there as far as local government elections are concerned? They have been pushed back now to February. Um, what are the factors that are at play? Um, in terms of determining when there is going to be local government election? I have to be careful in answering your question. These people believe that I am speaking on behalf of GCOM and advocate what's going on in GCOM. The chief elections officer presented a plan, which plan suggested that elections could be held on the 12th of December which was the deadline by law for the holding of the postponed elections because they were postponed for one year. The commission discussed that plan and a decision was taken that there was not enough flexi time in the plan and that there might be slippage and therefore it should be reviewed. That was the commission's decision. The chief elections officer did a review and came back with a plan for elections on the 13th of February. Again, in the commission, it was discussed, and it was felt by some that you're pushing it back too far, too much flexi time, go back and come back with something in January. So right now, there is no known or proposed date there is known, it is known that there was a proposed date of the 12th of December, there was a proposed date of the 13th of February, and there is a directive that the CEO should rework his plan for a date sometime in January. That is where we are at on the question of local government. May I make it clear that not because GCOM has made those decisions, it's a reflection of the views of all of the commissioners. There's a majoritarian system, and very often now in GCOM, decisions are made by majority vote. Have we lost uh, David? Sorry, I had I said, have you, thanks very much for that um, information. Have you um, elected a new um, deputy CEO? No. We have been very tardy and lackadaisical on the question of the staff, staffing of GPO. And since the CEO is appointed, all we have done so far is in the last three weeks, interviewed persons for position in the ACU. And so I think Yesterday, uh, the process of interviews for ACU came to the end, and therefore we may be on the verge of identifying a new ACU. The other offices, the chief accountant, the DCEO, uh, the, those, uh, the logistics manager, we have advertised, we have applicants, 
but we have not yet interviewed those persons. And so GCOM still does not have a number of key persons in the senior administration, even as we work towards an election uh, in the not too distant future. Well, all the lack of um, personnel in place in this senior position, how could it adversely affect the quality of um, an, an election, local government or otherwise? Well, you, you need these people to do work on specific areas. In their absence, then you have overload on particular officers and probably the CEO is overloading himself. And so when you have overload, then you have situations where the Peter Principle steps in and uh, mistakes are made, things are not done in a timely manner. And um, that is occurring. That is occurring. For example, um, when we looked at the, the, the last plan on Tuesday, the document had mistakes, which the CEO admitted to. And this is going to occur if one person seeks to laud it all and not have the requisite staff to render assistance and to do the work which uh, they're supposed to be doing. Um, there have been lots of talk um, recently about the um, voters list. Um, that, of course, is an older conversation, probably dating back to, what, 15 years? Um, but there has been a lot of back and forth over the last couple of days um, with the uh, uh, opposition leader um, up in the ante, um, as far as the list is concerned, cleaning the list, um, GCOM responding that it has to work within the law. And uh, um, now there's talk about um, the possibility of um, amending ROPA. Um, give us... Your, and here I'm asking you in your capacity, both as an expert on GCOM, having been a member there for a long time, but also your understanding of the electoral laws. Give us a sense of where things are. First of all, let me say what's happening in GCOM now is that the government appointed uh, commissioners plus the chairperson seem to be singing from a song sheet provided by the People's Progressive Party. They seem to be singing from that song sheet. So that if you hear an announcement or a pronouncement by the PPP, then you know what will be said to you in GCOM. If there's no announcement or pronouncement, then things are prolonged and not dealt with until there's a pronouncement or announcement uh, by the PVP. In that regard, we have sought to indicate that although GCOM may not have the power as an executive body rather than a legislative body, that GCOM could make the propositions and suggestions in terms of electoral reform. They have bluntly refused. They say, look, these issues are issues for the legislature. And so no action occurs at the, at, the, at the point of GCOM on matters which can be uh, proposed by GCOM, though it is not GCOM's responsibility to deal with those matters. And so as we face the conundrum of a judgment which says that we cannot take names off of the register of registrants and cannot take names off of the voters list, GCOM has refused to embrace any approach that can guarantee that the mischief which has been identified that can occur with such a list is not dead. So for example, we made the proposition that GCOM should pursue a biometric method at the place of poll. Now, it is difficult to say no to that. But what did they say? Rather than approve the motion, they said, look, we have to have a feasibility study. A feasibility study for things which have happened all over the world. The GCOM has to do a feasibility study 
to determine that biometrics can be used as a place of food. So they stymie the movement on this matter under the pretext of we have to do a feasibility study. And the Lord knows when that will be done. Then we tabled another motion and said, look, since we seem in principle to agree that this thing can work, subject to a feasibility study, let us recommend in the process of electoral reform that biometrics be introduced. So in other words, pass the recommendation on to uh, the body in government that's looking at electoral reform, reform of Rupa. That has not yet occurred. That debate has not yet taken place. But the, the indications are that we're going to go back to this argument about the feasibility and all of that, and that that motion will not, in fact, go forward. So the GCOM has shown absolutely no interest in resolving problems, which I think they should be resolved, given their constitutional responsibility. They should either resolve them themselves or they should make recommendations to the relevant bodies for those problems to be resolved. They are resisting that and singing every day from the song sheet of the People's Progressive Party. That song sheet has now placed uh, a chorus in relation to the documents that GCOM, GCOM received two years ago. And when we raised the matter of those documents, the chairman said to us at that time that those are matters for the court. GCOM has no such authority. Those are matters for the court. We're talking here about the documents that are um, asking for those documents. We're talking here about the documents that the police provided to GCOM police that and the, the attorney general is now asking for. Yes. Yeah. And those are documents for the court. So we will see. You will see what those who said that there are documents to the court, and the chairman in particular, will now say about his request for those documents. Because those documents are pertinent. They are pertinent to the petitions. The petitions. The petitions are still in the court pipeline. And here is the executive attempting to put their hands on those documents and specifying the purpose to determine culpability for documents which they are claiming might be fraudulent documents. These matters, these documents, are a part of a petition, and the law, the Constitution, clearly specifies that matters of that sort should be dealt with in a petition. There is a petition. The GCOM has stoutly defended not acting on certain matters because they are petition oriented. And we're now faced with the question of what will GCOM do with this next petition oriented matter that has been in cold storage for two years. In fact, the AG has raised two cold storage issues in recent times. He's raised now this request for these documents, and that was in cold storage. Uh, two weeks ago, he also raised another matter, I think in relation to the 49 boxes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it was another matter in cold storage. We, they have said that they're establishing a commission of inquiry and here we see that they are also taken out of the ambit of that commission of inquiry certain matters. And we told the commission of inquiry to start to work shortly. The commission established absolutely no consultation with GCOM about its terms of reference or about its composition. Oh, we are living in interesting times.
in our Guyana. My audience, please take note of all the information that we have gotten here tonight. Quite a mouthful from Mr. Alexander about what G has been going through since the PPP has come to power. And uh, it all came to a head when Jack Dio literally accused the leaders of stealing. And uh, now we know. And over at GCOM, the government is now asking for documents that were derived from the recount. A recount that the PPP doesn't talk about. It doesn't for two years. It's as if those information never existed. Oh, that's nonsense. Oh, people already said they were here when the police said that they weren't here. But no, they want those documents. And as Mr. Alexander said, those documents are central or integral to an ongoing petition. Very interesting times. Vincent, closing thoughts. Um, uh, <laughs> closing thoughts. <laughs> Well, I would say um, you said that they're interested, and that's a very neutral word. <laughs> perilous times. Perilous times. The one hand is the ongoing harassment. And the other hand is the ongoing choral. If you come singing from the same song sheet, the People's Progressive Party. I have no doubt in the case of the prodigy and in my own circumstance, that we will be vindicated because we have not been involved. And in fact, in many regards, Prodigy can be a model organization in this country in terms of the level of accountability. It's more than a model organization in terms of the level of scrutiny it has been subjected to. But we will prevail. And I am also sure in terms of the protection of my own personal integrity, I will prevail because my hands are clean. Are clean. Vincent Alexander, GCOM uh, Commissioner and the Chairman of IPAD G, really um, giving us uh, some chilling information tonight. And as he says, we are living in perilous time. Vincent, um, thank you so much for coming on as usual um, and uh, bringing us uh, some information right from the heart of the matter. Thank you so much um, for coming on tonight. Thank you very much. And good night to you and the viewing audience. And uh, to you, the viewing audience, uh, tomorrow we are going to be focusing on that rally at Golden Grove. Um, on Saturday, as usual, we are urging people to come out, to go out to that day. Go out and show your faces. Go out and show your body. Tomorrow, we're going to try to get um, a couple of the organizers. Um, I don't know. The, the, the opposition leader is very busy, but I'll try to see if I can get him to come on for a couple of minutes. But certainly, um, uh, 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 someone or a couple of people high up in the organizing committee of uh, the forum, uh, sorry, the uh, rally held in Golden Grove, Golden Grove, the village that has been in the news quite a lot because of the shooting down of young Quindon Bacchus. So it's the ground zero there on the east coast of Demerara and uh, the APNU AFC WPA rally will be there on, on, on Saturday. Tomorrow night, we'll try to get a couple of officials to come on. What a show tonight. Um, can you believe it? Can you believe these people are harassing an African Guyanese organization for $100 million? Let them trust the vouchers for the money that they give to the cricket. Let us trust the vouchers for all the building expo and all of that. Let them tell us whether they're giving Indian Guyanese organizations the money. These people are shameless. 
these people are carrying mean to wipe us off the face of Guyana, African people. Really, if you think that we have been exaggerating, my sisters and brothers, now you know that we have not. If you think we've been exaggerating when we say we are living in an apartheid state, hyper racism, $100 million you're harassing a black organization for? Can you all count, calculate the amount of money that black people work for in this country and weren't paid for 250 years? Now you are giving us a hundred million dollars, which is far less than you give to sugar workers who have already paid their severance. We black people have no human rights in Guyana. No, no, I will not steal my voice. As Martin Carter said, no, I will not steal my voice. I have too much to pay. So if you see me looking at your hands or listening when you speak, or marching in your hands, know that I do not sleep to dream, but I dream to change the world. Martin Carter, our national poet, no, I will not steal my voice. I have too much to claim. I have read from books, dear friend, of men who lived in a room without any light, hungering. Of men who did not die since death was far too poor. Prophetic words by the national poet. I will not steal my voice. You must not steal your voices. We are in the fight. Not, not since we walked through the gates of the plantation. We are in a fight for our very survival as human beings in Guyana. No, I will not steal my voice. I have too much to claim. Too much to claim. We, African Guyanese, and our friends, who are not African Guyanese, but who stand with us. We must not steal our voice. See you all tomorrow night. See you all tomorrow night. When we take our case to the streets, we'll talk about taking our case to the streets, to the streets of Golden Grove. We must not steal our voice. We have too much to claim. We have too much to claim. Good night.